Good afternoon. Welcome to Medicine in Our Backyard. This is a joint program sponsored by UCI Irvine Health and the Newport Beach Public Library Foundation. We are very grateful to our sponsors, Mike and Polly Smith. They were actually founders of this program and they have supported it ever since its initiation. The foundation, if, if you may not know, is a membership organization and we do invite you to become members. We support the library with things that it isn't provided for with by the city. So in other words, we are here to supplement. In addition to that, we have wonderful lecture programs, the witty lecture series, library live lecture series. I hope you've been coming to some of these. And if you haven't, please visit our website and become familiar with all of the things the foundation offers. Now this afternoon, a little bit of housekeeping. The questions will come, uh, we want you to post them under Q&A, not in chat, in Q&A. Uh, our speaker, Dr. Wang, will speak for half an hour and then we will welcome your questions. This will also be recorded so you will be able to go back to the website and hear this again if you wish to do that. So our speaker this afternoon is Dr. Susan Wang. She is the Medical Director of Epidemiology and Infection Prevention at UC Irvine Health and a Professor of Medicine in the Division of Infectious Diseases at the UCI School of Medicine. Dr. Wang received her MD degree from Johns Hopkins University and did her internship and residency at UC San Francisco Medical Center. She completed her fellowship in infectious diseases at Massachusetts General Hospital and at the Women's Hospital Brigham Young. She's coming to us on this beautiful sunny afternoon to talk about 10 questions we may have about the COVID vaccine. I don't know how many of you have been able to get it. I've already had my second one and I feel very relieved that that has occurred. And I know those of you who have been vaccinated, I hope will feel the same way. So let me please welcome Dr. Susan Wang, our speaker this afternoon. Thank you, Adrian. It's such a great pleasure to be here. And uh, let me go ahead and share my slides and see if we can get going. One second, I think I need to switch one thing. All right, I believe that should be correct. So um, let me know if anyone has a problem seeing the full screen. So I'm gonna go ahead and, um, and talk about COVID-19. There's so many key updates that have been um, present and there's so many questions that people have. So let's start by a bunch of really key questions. First of all, what on earth is an mRNA vaccine and um, how well does it work? So um, mRNA um, stands for messenger ribonucleic acid. It's actually an instruction set to make proteins. We have mRNA in every single cell of our body. Um, and that's because we need to make proteins in order to survive. So this particular mRNA vaccine um, gives one instruction set to make one particular protein. And that protein is the spike protein um, on the surface of the COVID-19 um, virus or SARS-CoV-2. And, and this particular spike protein um, is really helpful because that's the way that the virus gains entry into the, um, the host cells and antibodies to that protein are very, very effective in stopping infection. The mRNA vaccine, like I said, it injects an instruction set into your arm. Um, that mRNA does not mix with your DNA. It does not mix with your genes. It does nothing um, to your genetic code. For a very brief amount of time, the cells in your arm will pick up that mRNA and it will start to make the spike protein. Once it makes that spike protein, it recognizes immediately that it's not human and it starts to attack it. So it does this by making antibodies. It does this by helping your fighter cells, your white cells recognize um, these particular, this particular protein um, so that the next time it sees it again, it will continue to attack it. In the end of the day, the mRNA is very short-lived. It is destroyed. The spike protein is destroyed and all you have left is protective antibodies. 
So how protective um, are these COVID-19 vaccines? So there are two of them, they are like twins. There are two mRNA vaccines, two different companies. Um, these two companies have two doses each um, for their vaccines and they've each been studied in two very large clinical trials. And both of them generated the exact same twin results. So 94 to 95% protection from COVID-19 disease. You can see that the plots here look almost identical. Pfizer, 44,000 participants, half of which got the vaccine, half of which got a injection of saline into the arm. So what we call placebo or a control group. And you can see in the placebo group, the number of cases of COVID-19 just continues to rise and rise and rise over time. And the number of COVID-19 cases in the vaccine group just stops. You can see that there's very few cases that continue to occur after vaccination. That's the 95% protection. Same thing with Moderna. If you take a look again in the placebo group, more and more cases of COVID-19 continue to occur. And in the vaccine group, almost none um, after vaccination. So which COVID-19 vaccine is best? There are a lot of COVID-19 vaccines that have um, been developed. There are only two, the two that you see in green that are available here in the United States having been authorized in December. Like I said, they are twin vaccines, both mRNA, both two doses, both of them with very, very outstanding um, effect of 95% protection. And in fact, both of them also protective against the main variants that we're worried about today. It is highly unlikely that any of the forthcoming vaccines are actually going to be proven to be better than the two that we have in wide use in the United States today. The J&J &J vaccine, the Johnson & Johnson vaccine that you see here is the only one that is a single dose, but you can see that the protection is sizably less than what we currently have, 72% compared to 94 to 95%. That doesn't mean that it won't have a role. There are certain types of moments when that can be very important to have a one dose vaccine, even if it is less protective. That could be, for example, in people who have a very hard time coming back. Um, these might be people who, um, some fraction of the homeless population, it might also include people who live very far away from medical care. So why be vaccinated? What is it that we need to know about safety, side effects, and allergies? So um, we should all know that COVID-19 is a very serious threat. As you know, um, over 110 million people worldwide have been infected by COVID-19, 2.4 million deaths. A quarter of those deaths, a quarter of those um, cases are here in the United States. This is a very, very infectious virus. Um, and not only does it cause hospitalization and death, but even if you recover, what is becoming more and more well known is that a lot of people do not completely recover. They have what we call post-infection syndromes. They might have chronic pain, chronic muscle aches, chronic joint pain. They might experience brain fog. That is their clarity of thought just does not return completely to normal. And this is actually so common um, that there are areas in California that are now creating these chronic disease clinics specifically for people who are suffering from long-standing COVID-19 symptoms even after the infection is gone. We are still seeing um, tens of thousands of US COVID-19 cases a day here in the United States and still hundreds of people dying a day um, due to COVID-19. So another question that people ask is, well, does the vaccine make me sick? So on one hand, you have this balance of this tremendous amount of damage, of death, of hospitalizations that are occurring worldwide from this pandemic, and on the balance, um, a vaccine. And so people naturally want to ask, well, does this vaccine makes me, make me sick? So there's a couple of important things to understand about these mRNA vaccines. One, they are not alive. So they cannot give you COVID-19. They cannot make you contagious. They do not make you infectious. But what they do do is they stimulate your immune system, just like a vaccine is supposed to do. And so a lot of people that are building their antibodies or building their fighter cells against um, the COVID-19 um, protein um, will feel as if they have a mild case of the flu. So this could be some fatigue, some headache, muscle pain, joint pain, maybe some chills and fevers, a little bit of nausea. And that usually lasts for about a day, maybe two, and infrequently up to three days. Um, how many people will have at least one of these symptoms? If you look at the vaccine groups of the clinical trials, about 55 to 60% of people will have something, um, fatigue, 
headache. One of these symptoms, at least 55 to 60 percent after the first dose, and after the second dose, a bit higher, 70 to 80 percent will experience this. That's because your body um, has seen it before, and so it naturally um, has a much faster and firmer response. But take a look at the placebo group. So I told you that in the vaccine trials, you get a flip of a coin, half of people get the vaccine, half of them get the saline injection into the arm. Take a look at that placebo group. About 50 percent after the first dose said they felt something, a little fatigue, a little headache, some fevers, chills, something. And that's because as humans, we tend to feel something. We're not um, kind of going around every day feeling perfectly healthy. A lot of us have some fatigue or some headaches. And so the difference between the placebo and the vaccine group is important to note. And the vast majority who get this vaccine actually do not miss uh, a day of work or don't feel um, substantially ill. What about allergies? This is a growing interest of um, information. And it's important to know that humans have allergies to very specific things. So if you are allergic to peaches, you are not necessarily allergic to peanuts. It's a very natural response for the body to be very specific about the things that you're allergic to. The only allergy that will prevent you from getting this vaccine, the only contraindication is if you have a serious allergy to the vaccine itself, the vaccine or its ingredients. You should know that in contrast to some flu vaccines, this particular vaccine does not have a live phase. That means no one's tried to grow it in chicken eggs or anything like that. It has no risk for egg allergic individuals. Um, the risk of severe allergy or what we call anaphylaxis is actually dropping. So there was a moment where in the media, it was about 11 people per 1 million. So still incredibly rare. Now, after more and more people have been vaccinated, that has been revised to be even less, less than five people um, per million vaccinated. So a very, very rare event. If you do have a tendency for a lot of severe allergies, it's important to discuss your situation with your allergist. Your allergist may want to premedicate you with some Benadryl or give you something ahead of time before you take that medication. You are um, rec recommended to stay in the observation area for longer. So if you have a serious allergy, the recommendation is you sit there for 30 minutes instead of 15 minutes that's asked of everybody. All vaccine areas do have emergency allergy medication and they do know how to use it. What should you expect um, if you sign up for the COVID-19 vaccine? It is really important that you commit to both doses. The only thing that is known about these trials is that it takes two doses to get you 94 to 95% protected. So commit to getting both doses if you sign up. Be prepared that your body is going to generate an immune response. That's what you're, you want your body to do. You might feel like you have a mild case of the flu both times. Also, do not premedicate with anti-fever or anti-inflammatory medications. This could be aspirin, Tylenol, Motrin, or Advil. If you do not need them, please do not take them just in case ahead of time. Why is that? because those things are anti-immune response, anti-fever, anti-inflammatory, and you may blunt your immune response. We know this because of childhood vaccines. Parents who give their children Tylenol or Motrin before their childhood vaccines um, generally will drop the antibody response by a third or a half. So it's a pretty sizable effect. They still are protected, um, but with levels of antibodies that are much less than other people who don't give it to them ahead of time. It is important that if you become uncomfortable after you develop a headache, after you develop aches and pains, that's the time that you can take the Tylenol and the Motrin or the Advil. So not just in case ahead of time, after your immune response has a good solid response and if you are uncomfortable. So if you're not uncomfortable, ride it out. If you are uncomfortable, by all means, um, take these medications to make yourself feel more comfortable. If you are on these medications for a medical reason, you're on aspirin for heart disease, you're on Tylenol for low back pain and you really need it, then by all means continue to take your medications according to your doctor's orders. Your body will still generate an immune response. And as I mentioned, evidence suggests that the amount that's generated is in fact protective. Um, but if you can give your, your body the very best chance of building as many antibodies at the highest level possible, don't take these medications unless you really need to for medical purposes. 
What about the COVID vaccines and special circumstances? So what if you already had COVID-19? This is an increasingly common case. There are 110 million people out there who have had COVID-19 infections. So unfortunately, and it's almost unfair, that if you have natural infection with COVID-19, unfortunately, your body does not generate what we would consider to be a stable, solid, protective response. In fact, we know that the vast majority of people do not. They may be protected for about two to three months and that's about it. Having the whole entire virus infect your body means that the body can make a lot of different antibodies to a lot of different things on that virus and most of them are not very protective. So the body can be quite confused. The vaccine on the other hand generates one protein and your body makes protective antibodies to that one protein that tends to work really, really well. If you have been infected when can you get the vaccine? You can get it as long as you are no longer infectious, which is usually 10 days after your first symptom, and you have to be feeling well enough to be able to get a vaccine. So those two things are pretty um, simple to be able to do, and you can generally get the vaccine quite quickly after you have had COVID-19. Some people say, well, if we're super, super short on vaccine, you can wait a little bit because your body is generally protected for about two to three months. But remember, to get two doses of the vaccine takes over a month. It takes a couple of weeks for the doses actually to take effect. And so if you're talking about needing a month, a month and a half, maybe up to two months to actually generate a response to the vaccine, you can see that you don't have a lot of time between the amount of protection that you have from being infected to the amount of time that it takes to actually get those doses in you and for you to have an effect. The other thing that you should know is that you are not protected the minute that needle goes into your arm. You can absolutely get COVID-19 infection between vaccine doses. As I just mentioned, it takes two doses to be fully protected. And for each dose, it takes often several weeks for your body to actually make the protein and then generate the antibodies to the proteins and then have your cellular, your um, fighter cells recognize um, this protein. And in addition to that, we also know that it can take up to 14 days after you're exposed to someone to actually become ill. So some people might have been exposed to someone who's, who's ill with COVID-19 even before they got the vaccine, and they don't become sick with it until after they've gotten the vaccine. So what do you need to know? If you become ill with COVID-like symptoms on or around your vaccine day, the first thing you should do is try to reschedule if you haven't yet received the vaccine. If you already received the vaccine, then lucky for us, humans several times in our lifetime fight two things at once. We might have two different colds. We might have one toe infection and a cold at the same time. So the body is pretty robust in being able to fight multiple things. It's not the ideal way to do it. Your body will be fighting on two fronts, both the infection itself plus the vaccine that you just had injected into the arm, um, but you will be okay. And after you're no longer infectious and after you feel well enough to get a second dose, you should receive that second dose. What about pregnancy, people who are trying to become pregnant, people who are breastfeeding, um, and those who are immunocompromised? So as you know, the trials are usually looking for the average effect. And for that reason, they do not often enroll pregnant people or immunocompromised people in the first um, clinical trials that come out for a vaccine. But we all know that those who are pregnant and those who are immunocompromised really do have a higher risk for COVID-19 severe disease, hospitalization, and death. And for that reason, there's a lot of people in a lot of societies, the National Societies for Obstetrics and the National Societies for Transplant Medicine and Cancer Medicine are really urging people um, to be offered the vaccine and to discuss it with their doctors. The mRNA that's part of this vaccine actually does not cross the placental barrier and never reaches the baby. The only thing that actually passes to the baby are your protective antibodies. So that's what humans do. We protect our young. And that's why it's so powerful that mothers will pass on antibodies either through the placenta or through the breast milk to newborn children, which will protect them for about two to three months after they are born. If you have an immunocompromised state, either because you take medicines that, that restrict your immune system or because you have a condition that automatically affects your immune system, the issue for you is not safety. The safety of the vaccine is very similar to the safety of vaccine in anybody else. The difference for you is a partial benefit. That is, it is not certain that the vaccine will give you 95% protection. 
but it might give you 90% protection or 80% protection or 70% protection. And as we mentioned earlier in the year, over the summer, the United States said we would license a vaccine that was 50% protective. Why is that? Because very few things that we have are 50% protective against death and hospitalization and these type of post-infectious syndromes that can be so incredibly debilitating. So if you're pregnant or trying to become pregnant or breastfeeding or immunocompromised, do discuss this um, with your doctor. It is very important that your personal choice will be um, um, followed through on and you can absolutely get vaccinated. The timing may be important to discuss with your doctor because if you're on a cyclical drug that affects your immune system in waves, then it may be really important that you find out the timing that you should get the vaccine because of those cyclical medications. What about children? A very natural question is how do we protect our children? I'm afraid that there is no US vaccine that is authorized for children under the age of 16 at this time. And in fact, there are trials of children who are 12 years old and older, um, but those trials will not result until the summer. So the earliest that the trials will result and then the companies would apply for emergency use from the FDA, it's very unlikely that children will have access to the vaccine until either very late in the summer or more likely sometime in the fall. For children under the age of 12, those trials aren't even set to begin for mRNA vaccines until the summer. So it will not be in time for the start of school and safety precautions, infection prevention um, strategies are still going to be required for the school year later in 2021. The most important thing that we can get the word out is that if you want to protect your children, the number one thing that you can do is have every adult around those children vaccinated. And that's the best way we can prevent them from having disease and spreading disease to others. I wanna talk a bit about vaccine myths and myth busters. So what are some of the things that we can talk about that people say? One is, oh, once I get my dose, I am protected. That is absolutely not true. So just cause the needle went into your arm, again, every dose of the vaccine takes time to work. And it can take up to a month after every dose for your body to generate antibodies. For some people, it's as fast as a week. For some people, it takes two weeks, three weeks, four weeks, but if you really wanna get the whole group of the population to be very confident that they're protected, it can take up to a month um, after receiving a vaccine shot. Remember that the first shot gives you a kind of a boost to get ready, it's the second shot that locks it in. So you really do need both to get to the 95% protection that's been shown in the clinical trials. That is one week after the second dose for Pfizer, that's what the clinical trials measured and two weeks after the second dose for Moderna. We know that people during that window after one week or after two weeks are still increasing in their antibody levels. So it's not the perfect measure, but that's what they measured in the trials and they were already seeing a very high degree of protection um, by one and two weeks after the second dose. Remember that it's 95% protective. So there's still a 5% risk. That risk is going to be absolutely determined by how many people around you have COVID. So if you still have a huge winter surge, that 5% risk can be very, very meaningful. It also can be meaningful if everybody around you stops masking or if everybody stops behaving um, well and they start to have big parties where they share a lot of food and everybody takes off their masks. Another myth is that one dose is enough. You've seen a lot of this in the media and what they are doing is conjecturing. They are guessing. They're looking at the data um, and they're looking at this tiny little window between three weeks between Pfizer doses and four weeks between Moderna doses. Now remember, if you have COVID-19 infection, you do get temporary protection. So looking at that little window and seeing that it can be protective for a good number of people doesn't tell you how long that, that protection lasts. We know that being infected with the virus does not give you durable protection. So the big question is, how much longer do you need? How many booster shots do you need to lock it in? Both companies, two competing companies who did not talk to each other, two companies looked at their early data and both of them determined that even in the setting of a pandemic, they needed to create a two-dose vaccine. That tells you that there were early data, early suggestions that two vaccines were needed. To reach 95% protection, you absolutely need both doses. One dose is like getting infected with the virus. It doesn't last. Second dose locks it in. Remember the J&J &J vaccine, which is a one dose series, really does not give you a high level protection, 72% compared to 
5%. That lower degree of protection, again, it can be very important for those who can't get two doses, but will affect how quickly the pandemic ends. Another myth, and this is a big one that people talk about is, um, what if the vaccine just protects me from getting sick? but I'm getting asymptomatically infected and spewing virus all over the place and infecting people and I don't know it. So this is um, a myth that has no grounding in reality for all the respiratory viruses that we have um, vaccine to. So we know that for all prior historic vaccines, that is not what happens. It doesn't happen that it just stops disease, but then you get asymptomatic disease and then you spread it to everybody else. There are three important things to note about this myth. Number one, the vaccine itself, as I mentioned before, is not alive. The vaccine itself cannot give you COVID-19. So no, the vaccine will not make you shed and spread um, from the vaccine itself. Number two, it is only 95% protective. So if you break through, if you are one of the unfortunate people who actually develops COVID-19 and you are truly infectious and you have a test that shows that you're infected, then absolutely you are likely to be shedding virus. So breakthrough disease will be contagious, but what's really nice is that there's early evidence now and a lot of good evidence about all the other respiratory diseases that we have viruses, um, vaccines to, that in fact you shed less, not more. And finally, there is no carrier state for COVID-19. That is, it doesn't sit in your nose, doesn't sit in your throat, it doesn't sit there while you're protected from disease so it doesn't invade you, but then it spreads to everybody else. It doesn't exist that way. This particular state of COVID-19, we have shown at UC Irvine Health, we have vaccinated about 10,000 healthcare professionals. And what we saw immediately within a couple of weeks of the second dose, we saw a complete loss of our cases, not just of symptomatic cases, but in healthcare, we do a lot of asymptomatic random testing. And we saw our asymptomatic cases go to zero. So this kind of shedding and spreading of the virus um, is not true. There's a couple of additional myths that are out there that are really important to address. Um, a myth that the vaccine will cause cancer. This is absolutely not true. In fact, believe it or not, mRNA vaccines are being used to fight cancer. It's just a way to make a protein that the body will attack. So you can make that protein as a virus protein, you can make that protein as a cancer protein, but it's actually a really wonderful way to enhance the immune system against cancer. Um, the idea that the vaccine implants a microchip, absolutely not true. Nothing is implanted. You can't even see anything. That needle that goes into your arm is so thin. It only handles liquid. There is nothing permanent. How do you know that? mRNA is naturally unstable. It doesn't last a long time and that's by design. The body doesn't want you to make a certain protein forever and ever and ever. When we make proteins that we need in our cells, we want it turned on and we want it turned off as quickly as we can do it. We just want the protein when we need it. So the mRNA vaccines are here and able to be used because we have cold storage, because we figured out how to cool down the vaccine to keep it stable until we can inject it. That tells you how short-lived that MRSA message is. It is not going into your genes. It's not doing anything that's going to affect you permanently. Same thing, this idea that the vaccine causes infertility. I'll tell you that vaccine doesn't leave your arm. It's injected into your arm and your arm knows what to do with something that's injected there. It starts to, your cells come around that injected pot of liquid and start to, um, to swallow it into the cells and the cells digest it and it all happens within your arm. All of that spike protein is being generated in your arm. All those antibodies are being generated through the cells that come towards your arm and then distribute the antibodies, not the mRNA, not the protein, just the antibodies throughout your bloodstream. So it's important that you know it goes nowhere near your reproductive organs. It doesn't touch your genetic materials. It does not affect your DNA. This is another myth is, oh, you know what? I'm just gonna wait. I'm just gonna wait and see. I need a little more time to understand what's going on. So clinical trials, are really, really important. There were, as I told you before, 77,000 people in both clinical trials combined who agreed to be part of that clinical trial. Half of them got vaccine, half of them got placebo. And we give a lot of credit to those people who were the first out of the gate. Clinical trials help us understand common side effects. After those clinical trials, all of this kind of post-marketing, post-authorization use that's happening today confirms these common side effects and helps us find rare ones. 
So if you're standing on the sidelines, you're thinking, okay, I'm definitely letting those 77,000 people who are in the clinical trials go by and tell me what this vaccine is going to do, how much it's going to protect, how much it's going to cause side effects. So you're standing on the sidelines saying, I'm not going to get into the line yet. Then it becomes authorized for post-marketing use. And then you start to see, you know, 100,000 more people get into line, right? 250,000 people get into that line and you're still standing on the sidelines. We are vaccinating a million people a day. 43 million people have gotten into that line and been vaccinated. 25 million people outside of the United States have gotten the Moderna or the Pfizer vaccine already. So you are at 68 million people have gotten into line before you. We are still coming off of our winter surge. There are still people who are dying in Orange County every single day. There are hundreds of people who are becoming positive, thousands of people becoming positive for COVID-19 in the United States every day. What are you waiting for? 68 million people have gotten into line before you. How many more people do you need to get into line to tell you that this is a safe and effective vaccine? Is there a solution to COVID-19 variants? So again, a lot of media um, about this. And you know, why do variants happen? They happen because the virus infects someone and while they're infected inside the body, it grows, it, it reproduces. As it reproduces, it can mutate. And it's those mutations that cause variants. Now, these variants have always been there for viruses and bacteria. We know that it happens. The difference is that we have really nice scientific grounds for molecular testing, so we can see these variants now. We can see that what's circulating now may not be the same as what was circulating two or four months ago. So what do we need to do to stop variants? There are two ways to stop variants. Because variants occur when a virus gets to replicate, when cases are high, when it's infecting a lot of humans and it gets to reproduce, the main goal is to stop the cases. So the way that you do that is through good behavior, right? Cleaning your hands, wearing your mask, um, keeping a six foot or greater distance from people, not having food parties with people outside of your households, um, and by vaccinating. So vaccination is actually a critical way to stop variants. Fortunately, what we know is that the variants that we have circulating in the United States are active. The vaccines are active against these variants. And that's been proven in published papers from both Pfizer and Moderna. We know that the sera, that is when you take blood from someone who's been vaccinated, it will in fact neutralize or kill the variant viruses from the UK and from Moderna. I'm sorry, um, from the UK and from South Africa. Um, right now here in Southern California, our dominant variant is the California variant. And we know that the vaccines are very effective. How do we know that? Well, like I said, at UC Irvine Health, we have vaccinated 10,000 healthcare providers and we have seen the cases absolutely plummet. So we know that it's very, very active against the, the California variant. We do know that over time, these vaccines are very likely to last maybe a year at a time, that it's very likely that this will be very similar to the flu vaccine where we do need to get a, a vaccine every year. And because of that, the mRNA vaccines are very, very easy to modify. Just like flu vaccines, you can actually modify them quite easily, in fact, easier than flu vaccines, and they can actually address variants if they needed to. So fortunately right now, it doesn't look like they need to urgently do anything, but they are preparing. And that's what you're reading in the media. They are preparing for a need to modify and they can modify if they need to. When will the COVID-19 pandemic come to an end? I think this is what we're all desperately waiting for. When can we stop masking? When can we have parties again? When can we do the things that we consider to be normal? And um, this is a slide that I really like to show because if you hear the news, it says we need to be 70 to 90 to 85 percent vaccinated for this pandemic to really come to an end. 70 to 85 percent of the human population needs to be vaccinated. So where does that number come from? That number comes from what we know about the contagiousness of pathogens. Pathogens are measured by a contagiousness that is called a reproductive number. That is, if one person is infectious, and everybody around them is susceptible, how many people will that one person infect? So if you take a look at measles, measles is the most contagious pathogen known to man. One person will infect 12 to 18 other people if everybody around you is susceptible. If you take a look at COVID-19, the number that keeps coming up over and over again is five. 
Five, if you do nothing to protect yourself. Five, if everybody around you is susceptible. So if you take a look at this table, you can see that anything that has a reproductive number around five requires about 70 to 85% vaccination in order to stop the pandemic. And that's where the number comes from. What if we don't reach that? So right now, Orange County, 10% vaccinated. We have a long, long way to go. And remember I told you that no child gets to be vaccinated anytime soon. So the adults are gonna have to make up the majority of that vaccine group. We are at risk of two things happening. One, it's wonderful that we see this U-turn. You can see the cases falling. We have this rapid U-turn and it's not because of vaccine. It's because we are behaving better, because we've seen the case counts, we've seen the death counts, we've seen the hospitalization where for two months we had no ICU beds. Here at UC Irvine Health, we had a mobile field hospital in our parking lot. We had outpatient areas that were commandeered for inpatient beds, and we still had people coming through the ED and waiting for inpatient beds. We had so much need at the hospital, and we still have that mobile field hospital in our parking lot there today to increase our capacity. So even though we've taken a sharp U-turn, this has been a really devastating winter for COVID-19. As we see people behave better, as they hear that there's no hospital beds, as they hear that they better behave better, they need to be careful, we have been able to make a nice U-turn in our cases here in Orange County. Then we'll start to see the season change. When the season changes, when the weather gets better, we will further see the drop in cases. If you recall last September, there were almost no cases and everybody said, oh, it's gone, it's done. So if we have people who say, you know what, it's over, I don't need to vaccinate because it's over. What you will see is that we will reap what we sow next winter. If we do not reach 70 to 85% vaccinated by next November, we will see a really, really harsh winter. And we will see nursing home outbreaks, We'll see community outbreaks in communities that did not have a high degree of vaccination, and we will absolutely see hospitalizations and death. So as the weather suits us, as the season changes, as we get to have that case count come down, this is the time for us to vaccinate in the highest numbers that we can get. So that by the time the, the summer rolls around, the fall rolls around, we actually achieve that vaccination level. If we can achieve it, that is when we can declare the pandemic over. So who makes that decision? Public health needs to make that decision. They are counting the vaccinated people in Orange County. They know that SARS-CoV-2 will wax and wane by the season. And they're gonna decide when the cases fall to incredibly low levels. And when the vaccine levels look like we're going to achieve herd immunity, that is when we can declare the pandemic over. I'll remind us about H1N1. This is not our first pandemic. Um, H1N1 in 2009 was a declared a pandemic. The reason why we stopped that pandemic is because of vaccine. After the vaccine was released in 2009, how many years did it take for H1N1 to stop being the dominant source of flu deaths and flu hospitalizations in the United States? It took eight years. For eight years, every winter season, 40,000 people would die from H1N1, mostly, um, and flu. So this is what's likely to happen with SARS-CoV-2. If we cannot get vaccine safety and herd immunity, we will see this particular virus rear its head every winter over and over and over again. And in the summer, people act very, very poorly because the virus will still be there just in lower numbers. So we need to really encourage vaccination as quickly as we can over the upcoming months. If you have other questions, I'm really pleased to say that UC Irvine Health has released a 40 question um, FAQ, frequently asked questions. They're grouped in the following areas, um, much of which we reviewed together. And you can actually go to this website and download it um, and take a look at the, at the vaccines um, questions that are available there. This is just an example of that website. Um, and there'll, there'll actually be a downloadable version that's gonna be posted soon, where you can actually hyperlink to the question to the answer and then back to the question list again. So it's been an absolute pleasure. I'm talking with all of you. And at that this point, I'm gonna turn it back over to Adrian. Thank you very much, Dr. Wang. This is really so helpful to all of us because you know we we have this level of anxiety that we're living with and 
And just knowing that this vaccine is there and available to us and it's free. I mean, it, it's, it's, it's a wonderful gift that we have. Uh, we have some questions here. Let me see. Uh, what can we do after being vaccinated? So, you know, um, I think the question is, what, um, what are the gains of being vaccinated? So let me, let me just enumerate some of them. One is an absolute peace of mind. You are 95% protected. That is a very, very reassuring number. I can tell you that for healthcare providers, when those vaccines came, there was just this sense of enthusiasm. You know, like we had this kind of utter pall of depression of taking care of the sickest of the sick. Um, and all of a sudden there was this the kind of lightheartedness that took over this real optimism that the vaccine was here. So the first thing that it really does give you a remarkable peace of mind, especially if you live with people who are at high risk. This would be anybody who is old Older, um, in years, anybody who has comorbidities, and ultimately even the children because they can't be vaccinated. One immediate gain that you get is that you will not be quarantined if your household um, has a household member who's infected. So if your spouse becomes sick, if your child becomes sick, you actually are not under lock and key, um, which is important because we don't like to feel like we really can't go out. So that's one immediate benefit um, that comes to you after you are completed in your vaccine series. So not when the first dose goes into your arm, after both doses are in your arm and a couple of weeks have gone by, that's two more weeks have gone by. Um, that's the recommendation from public health that you do not have to be quarantined from work. You don't have to be quarantined from going out and interfacing with other people that, that you would like to, um, to meet with, but with all the safety precautions in place. You still have to wear everything. You still have to do everything. We are still just coming off of a very, very high surge. There are lots of people in this community that still have COVID-19 and we don't, we barely have vaccine touching our community. So soon again, the faster we get to 70 to 85 percent, the faster we can declare that this is over, but we've got a long way to go. So for the foreseeable future, all protections need to be in place. And again, for school in the fall, unfortunately, they are not old enough to get the vaccine. They will need protections as well. So actually, those of us who are listening to you today should go out and proselytize and, and convince our friends, perhaps. Yes. Or every adult needs to get this vaccine. To get it, absolutely. Uh, I, you've answered this. How long after the second shot will we be considered safe? It's different with the Pfizer and Moderna, didn't you say? So the, the trials, which are our best data, is that you're 95% protected after seven days from the second dose for Pfizer and 14 days from the second dose for Moderna. But I will tell you, that we all know that the antibodies continue to ramp for a month. And you will all hear about rare cases where someone got infected within a couple of weeks of their second dose. So I think after about a month's time, you can really feel like you have solid protection. But don't be surprised if a few people break through between doses, a few people break through even right around um, their second dose. It can happen if the community cases are high. So we continue to social distance, we continue to wear masks, and we continue to be very careful. Uh, this is what you're telling us. Now, we still need to do all of those things, yes. But we have a peace of mind. It's a little bit, you still feel safer, you really do. So we have another question. Can you address reinfection? Um, so um, reinfection, this is the, the sad state of affairs that getting the infection does not protect you from getting it again. Really, really unfortunate. It's not super common to get it again, but remember, coronavirus is a cold virus. How many of you have gotten many colds in your lifetime, right? It's not all coronavirus, it could be echovirus, it could be other things, but the truth is, we as humans are not great about building immunity to colds. We are susceptible to colds our whole lifetime. This is a cold virus. It's just that we don't have any protection against it, so it looks much more severe, but it is a nasty cold virus. So if you think about that, and before COVID-19 actually came into being, we humans demonstrated about one to three years of protection against coronavirus. So we have some, it doesn't last. And for that reason, we need to have a vaccine that helps direct our body to make the right antibodies. So unfortunately, we just, our bodies get confused. We make a lot of protein, uh, a lot of antibodies, but not to the best stuff. All right, now, if, if we've had the COVID vaccine, is it, does that 
uh, pre well, let's see, prevent us from getting other vaccines for other things? Ah, great question. So remember, as I mentioned to you that your body can handle being infected with a couple of things at the same time. You can handle a paper cut, which actually puts bacteria into your skin. At the same time, you handle having a cold. You know, the body is a pretty resilient thing, but we don't like to challenge the body at the same time if we don't need to challenge the body at the same time. We don't want you to feel kind of that slight flu-like syndrome, you know, times two if you don't have to. So generally what they're going to say is, you want about two weeks between two different vaccines. If you have to pick, favor the COVID one by all means, put your shingles one off, put your, you know, the other ones off. Um, but they will also say, if you have no choice, it took you 14 days to get this appointment. And for whatever reason you were due for your flu shot, which you should have already gotten, um, but some other shot, you know, one, delay the other shot by all means. And if you have to get it because you have no other opportunity, then just get it. So that's what it says on the CDC website. If you have no other opportunity, take advantage of every opportunity that you can get that COVID-19 um, flu shot. For those of you who have gotten the shingles vaccine, that is a whopper of a vaccine. This vaccine is much easier than the shingles vaccine. And, you know, we know how much we want to protect against shingles. That is not a fun disease to have. So I'm just putting in perspective, you know, um, the fear of the COVID-19 vaccine. Um, yes, some people get symptoms. And I will tell you as as a kind of uh, the main um, kind of person who talks a lot about vaccines at UC Irvine Health, I get an equal amount of phone calls from people who don't have symptoms, who are really worried that their immune system is not doing its job as I get from people who've had symptoms. So expect the symptoms. And if you're lucky enough to be the 25% that have no symptoms either dose, then lucky for you, it's still 95% protective. Great. Uh, one of our listeners has a shellfish iodine allergy. Uh, should she get the vaccine? So if you have an allergy to anything else but the vaccine, you are eligible to get the vaccine. The only difference is that if you tend to have a propensity to have serious allergic reactions to a ton of things, like you're just allergic to a ton of things, then you really do want to talk to your allergist that your immune system, just for whatever reason, has a lot of kind of generalizable allergies. But if you have an allergic reaction to shellfish or you have an allergic reaction to peanuts or you have an allergic reaction to cashews and you've been living your life and you are only allergic to that one thing, the only thing they're recommending that you do is one, if you are supposed to carry EpiPens, carry your EpiPens, just like you're supposed to anyways, to wait for 30 minutes in that area instead of 15. Make sure someone knows you've been vaccinated. If you have to leave that area, make sure someone's with you, right? If you have a propensity, but it's rare, five in a million, it's rare. But be prepared. A serious allergic reaction is not anything that we want someone to be driving. We don't want someone to have one. So if all it takes is you to bring a book and sit there for a little bit longer, that's fantastic. If you really are a highly allergic person, talk to your doctor and they may give you some Benadryl ahead of time, but then you can't drive. Remember, it makes people sleepy. So there are things that you may want to talk to your doctor if you really, really tend to have allergies. And I don't mean seasonal stuffy nose. I mean, allergic reaction to things, to things that you eat or medications that you take. Thank you. Uh, this is a logistical question from someone who was vaccinated with the first shot at UCI and is due for the second one on February 27th, but hasn't been able to make an appointment. Ah, this is easy for me to answer because anything from UCI, we know how this works. So generally you will hear from us one week before your scheduled appointment. Um, and it usually is given on the weekend. So sometimes if you're, let's say you're due at four weeks, but it's like on a Tuesday, it'll likely be that following weekend. They'll give it to you, making sure that you have the right distance between your doses. And um, generally about one week prior, you'll get an assigned date and time. And it will say, this is your time that you need to come. And it's very likely to be the same day. If you've got it on a Saturday, it'll be a Saturday. If it's a Sunday, it's very likely to be a Sunday. But you do need to prepare because of the complexity of scheduling, you will be informed what time that you need to come. There is a way to cancel it, but it's very hard to reschedule. So we are going to encourage you to try to be as available as possible, um, but it'll, it'll just come right to you in your inbox. So you don't have to worry. 
And that way they make sure it's the right kind. So if you got Pfizer, you get Pfizer. If you got Moderna, they will make sure that you got the right dose. And if we get boosters, if you had Moderna, will the booster be Moderna? And if you got so in the future, you know, so these two shot series should be the same. Again, if for whatever reason you lost your card and you have no idea, the CDC says then just get a second dose. But in general, we want to be as close to the clinical trial, same dose, same manufacturer. Um, in the future, when it, it converts to what we all think is going to be an annual vaccine, then it doesn't matter which one you get. You know, it's due every year. And just like the flu shot now, you don't have to remember which one you got last year. You can just get one this year. So, uh, so very likely it won't matter. And in fact, if it really does become yearly at some point, some smart pair of companies will put the flu and the COVID-19 together and then we can get one shot. So we'll have to wait to see a little bit longer, but I'm pretty sure that it's looking like it's likely to be annual for quite some time, if not forever. So we'll just line up the way we do for flu shots. <laughs> yes. Yeah, that would be easier. Then everyone has access and it's easy to give. Uh, we have a question about when will it be safe to travel the world? And I'm, I'm thinking there was an article this morning in the Wall Street Journal about Israel and the fact that I think they have re reached the 85% vaccination. That's remarkable. Yeah, they're doing beautifully. Um, you know, their population is much smaller than ours, um, but boy, they are very organized. So um, it is good to see these things happen and see their cases plummet and, and see that vaccines work and, and exactly like it's pro projected to do. That's what we would love to see here in the United States. So a couple of things, if you need to travel, um, you can travel. You can travel before the vaccine and you can do it safely. There are ways. In fact, some of our FAQs in our website, there's a whole section on, you know, how, how do you keep your family safe? Those types of um, things are there. Um, and how do you travel if you have to? So you have an ill relative, you've got to go, then you go. But there are things and you know all the things you need to do. That mask needs to be snug. You need to clean your hands. Don't touch your face without cleaning your hands. Keep a distance, right? from anybody that's not masked. And even if they are masked, you still need six feet. So lots of things that you can do, wipe down surfaces, all of that. But in the future, do we anticipate that there will need to be a vaccine passport? I think it's very likely that you will either need to show vaccination or continue to get swabbed. Um, very close to the time of travel. So, you know, my mind, it's much easier to be vaccinated um, than it is to do all of that. So we'll wait to see what ends up being the case, but a lot of international travel does currently require a swab before getting onto that plane. I, I noticed that in Israel, many of the activities you're required to, to demonstrate that you've been vaccinated or you're not allowed to enter. Uh, I'm, I'm sure that's going to happen in many instances here in this country. I suspect too that people will see it as a violation of their freedom. Uh, any comments on that? I think what's very likely to happen is it will be added to the vaccine schedule. So what does that mean? Well, if you think about what is in place right now, so the, the vaccine right now is under an emergency use authorization. What does that mean? That means at the time it went before the FDA, there was two months of safety data. Um, that's what it takes for any drug. And generally for vaccines, you know everything about that vaccine within two months. So luckily for us, plenty of time to know safety. Um, once you get six months of safety data, four more months, you can go for full approval. So the FDA has already said they want these vaccines to go for full approval as soon as possible. We anticipate that's going to be able to be done in April or May. Once it is fully approved is when the rules about mandatory um, vaccination can be made in certain areas, depending on the legal status of those claims. It's very likely to be added to the childhood vaccination schedule once we get a fully approved vaccine. As you know, here in California, it varies state by state, um, but effectively here in California, by junior high, if you are not fully vaccinated, there are very, very few um, outs um, where you can continue to be in school without being vaccinated. So those types of things are likely to happen. At UC Irvine Health and in many healthcare areas, um, you actually have to mask continuously if you don't get the flu shot. Some places you actually have to get the flu shot or you can't be a vac an employee. So, you know, those things exist. And it's very likely um, that at UC Irvine Health, that if you don't get the COVID-19 vaccine, that you will continue to have to mask even when everybody gets to take off their masks. So there will be opportunity um, and a need for safety to safe keep the population from a highly, highly contagious virus. And I do think you'll start to hear more and more on that after full authorization has been achieved. 
Thank you. <clears throat> and we have one last question here on how soon will the next tier be able to get vaccinated? Ah, oh, wonderful. Today, right? So did you see the notice that uh, we are now open to education, child care, right? Uh, the, um, we are open to those types of high-risk agriculture food services. So it's not quite the next tier. It's kind of the the 1B prime, right? So that tier is open and they're gonna dedicate about 30% of the vaccines um, in California to that effort while still vaccinating the other prior groups, right? Because a lot of healthcare providers are now vaccinated or they've been given their opportunity. So now we're still trying to get the 65 years old, right? We're gonna keep moving out to everybody who wants one, but not hold up for people who are wondering, oh, maybe now, maybe later. Well, you can keep thinking about it. We're gonna move to the next group who is dying to have it. So we're really excited that this is moving. We're also moving doses into the major um, drugstores. Um, so CVS and Walgreens, who played a very important part in vaccinating the long-term care areas are now gonna be able to provide vaccine to qualified eligible people at major stores. So we're moving closer and closer. Um, as you know, we have 300 million doses of Pfizer that's been promised in 2021 and 300 million doses of Moderna, both in the first half of 2021. So we will be swimming in vaccines soon, cannot come soon enough, um, but I really do think we need just another month or two to start to really get those floodgates wide open. And this last questioner asks that I tell Dr. Wang what a wonderful job you've done in educating us all. And I I echo that. You've done this with such enthusiasm. And, and uh, I want to remind everyone that this is recorded. If you have friends who are hesitant, I think it would be great to ask them to just to listen in and, and to hear what Dr. Wang has told us today. So we thank you for being with us. Our speaker next month on the 22nd of March is Dr. Ruth Benka. And she's going to be talking to us about sleep in the time of COVID. If some of you have had sleepless nights, I think I have, uh, this will give us a placebo. So go forward, be well, be safe. And thank you very much for being with us today.